It's not that long ago when people in North America or Europe felt very far removed from the effects of a drought in the Horn of Africa. There are no local problems anymore. Uh, the challenge of climate change is a global challenge. Uh, and the typical mindset of let's have local solutions or I'll solve my own little part of the problem is running up to its limits. And while Africa has had very little to do with what's causing the climate problem, it's feeling the brunt of the extreme weather patterns and left footing a bill they can't afford. And this is a call for us to see the problem as global, identify the needs as global, identify where the resource needs are most urgent and where the resources are most able, and then work to create opportunity out of the challenge in a way that's timely. Uh, my name is Michael, Michael Olabisi. I'm an assistant professor here at Michigan State University in the Department of Community Sustainability. So um, I work at the intersection of economic development and sustainability. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, those two increasingly intertwined over time. Michael Olabisi is also the author of Paying Africa's Climate Bill, published in the March issue of Finance and Development magazine. So in this piece that we're going to talk about today, you talk about novel solutions to the funding gap when it comes to climate. Um, but it seems the, the not-so-novel approach ha- has dominated the strategies of the past several decades um, with not much to show for it. Are we in a rut, do you think? Yeah, I think that's a good way to describe it, that we're in this rut where we have a habit of doing some things and we're faced with a new situation and uh, we have not yet figured out how to reinvent uh, the tools we have or come up with new tools for addressing a relatively different challenge. The the novel solutions I highlight, uh, you could say stem from two perspectives. On the one hand is the cold cash practical perspective, Mm -hmm. which says, ask the experts, ask those who know best how much it will cost to have a meaningful response to climate change, both at the local, regional, and global levels, and add those numbers up, and then look around to see who has the resources to match that need. And the way the numbers look is an order of three trillion over the course of a decade for Africa, uh, more than a trillion a year on the global scale Mm -hmm. uh, that's needed to to have like a meaningful, above bare minimum response to climate change. Mm -hmm. And the development banks, the international financial institutions that typically address international challenges, Mm -hmm. uh, which is what climate change has been coded as at this point, do not have those resources. I mean, I'm sure... They wish they do, and, and I, I'm aware that many of them are gearing up and working very hard to raise those resources, but at this point, they just do not have them. And I don't think the world can wait another decade or two decades for the World Bank or the IMF to reinvent themselves and raise the resources needed hmm. to address climate change. So I guess this is a slow build up to the fact that it, we should just ask who spends about a trillion dollars plus a year Uh, that we can approach and say, look, here's a a new way to spend your money. Hmm. And that's the private sector. Exactly. I mean, why is it, do you think, that the the private sector hasn't uh, really been proactive or or jumped in where there seems to be, you know, some opportunity there for them? Yeah, you're correct that uh, that question naturally falls out too. Like if the private sector does have the resources why is it not seizing the opportunity? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, there's a, it's a host of answers, but some of the most prominent elements of it uh, is that the incentives uh, are not clearly lined up. And in some ways, there's also the question of policy uncertainty, combined with some other you know, typical political economy challenges that uh, make it hard for corporations to invest and commit. Mm-hmm. Uh, to just take a step back, the typical corporation needs two things. Uh, they need an opportunity to invest and create value, economic value. And they also need the certainty 
that when they invest, things won't shift around too much until they make their return. An easy example uh, will be a country like China, the world's largest auto market to the end. At this point, also the largest market for electric vehicles. Mm-hmm. And I'm not you know, standing here you know, championing electric vehicles as the only solution, but it's a good example. You know, more than a decade ago, the Chinese policymakers made a commitment and we will you know, make a positive shift towards EVs. Uh, it was a very firm policy commitment. There was incentives thrown behind it. And all the people who were in the business of making and selling cars knew that this commitment was not to waver and they could see the opportunity of, you know, we have to find a way to make profit selling EVs in uh, what was going to be the world's most populous country and largest EV market. And you know, a decade later, the, the results you know, speak for themselves. And we are looking at, I think this will be the first year where half of the cars sold in China uh, will be EVs. Uh, wow. The U.S. is still trailing behind. We're still talking you know, 10%, 12%, maybe, hopefully, end of this year. Um, so in a way... When policy incentives are set and firm for the firms to operate in and the firms understand that this is their way to make a profit, uh, they commit to it, they invest, and and we see results. Hmm. Okay, so there's no escaping this uh, the climate crisis. I mean, the impact is being felt in different ways in, in different parts of the world, and, and they all have funding challenges to address it. But would would you say the stakes are are higher in Africa? Do you think? Absolutely, and in in many ways, this is the point of the article that I wrote. Uh, the stakes are higher for two simple reasons. On the one hand, uh, you have the issue of exposure. Um, by exposure, I mean, especially when you think of things like agriculture, when you are in a region of the world that's already hotter than average, uh, and the trend looks to warmer you know, climate. Uh, issues like heat stress affecting yield are a lot more significant for the typical African country than, say, Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you're in an area where about half the population is involved in agriculture, a large share is quite literally subsistence, you know, whether you eat depends on what your farm, your land produces, and you don't have things like irrigation as uh, adaptation, the exposure to the risk of climate is very high. That exposure vulnerability is then coupled with a second challenge of uh, the lack of resilience. Um, So it's not as if, you know, the average African country is high income and can muster the resources to adapt or deal with the challenges that climate change will bring. And and in the article I mentioned, you know, you have large coastal cities like Lagos and Dakar, uh, maybe even Conakry to some extent. I mean, that's about a million people. Uh, who, if we know the sea levels will rise on the order of like a meter or three feet in the course of the century, cities like Miami can afford to put funds out and you know, build a seawall or install pumps, other things to mitigate the effects of rising waters. Um, Charleston might struggle, South Carolina, but, uh, but they still have the resources to do it. They can muster that. Um, Lagos, a city of you know, approaching 16 million people on that range, uh, does not. So the the absence of resilience, uh, the absence of resources to adapt or deal with the change uh, is a lot more pressing on the continent. And the combination of this to the the, the high exposure to things like higher temperatures, more droughts, rising seas or rising waters is real. And the absence of tools to respond to the change or be resilient in the face of change um, compounds the challenge. And, and I, th- I, th- I think it's important that you know, both locally and globally policymakers understand the dual nature of this challenge facing African countries. Mm. Yeah, and, and locally and globally, like you say, uh, you're right, because, um, I mean, whatever happens in Africa doesn't stay in Africa in terms of climate. It spills over borders in, in different ways. Uh, Africa is also home of the youngest and the fastest growing population in the world. So do you see the the international community actually acknowledging uh, how important it is that we help in whatever way we can Africa to deal with this climate crisis. Thank you, and I, I love that you you highlighted that. 
Um, the, the next things I'm going to say both address your previous point about opportunity that the private sector can see, mm -hmm. but also the need for policymakers to pay attention. Um, if you looked at every region of the world broadly defined, so the, so the North America, South America, Europe, uh, Asia, and Australasia, uh, just about every region in the world right now, the population is either fairly stable or declining. Yeah. Uh, the, the region of the world where we still have notable population growth is Africa. Right. So on the one hand, uh, if you are a corporation that wants to survive more than 40 years and you're thinking, where will my market be? You need to start looking you know, what options exist for creating a market, sustaining a market, investing in industries and a renewable energy economy in Africa so that you know, that's where my income comes from. Uh, on the other hand, if you're a policymaker looking for where the challenges of the future will be or, or how do we prevent millions of climate refugees out of illegal studies, you know, a quarter underwater in, in 40 years, mm -hmm. um, we need to look to Africa as you know, the site for both opportunity and challenge. And um, again, you phrased it very perfectly. This is not a question of choices we have. We do not have a choice that th things will happen and many of them will be centered around the African continent. What we do have as a choice is how quickly we respond to make opportunity out of those challenges. I know for more than a decade, there was a conversations about putting solar panels in the Sahara and Morocco and then shipping the energy to Spain. Um, political, you know, technical and other considerations have held that up, uh, but it's not too difficult to think of other variations on that project or just you know, walk around that still makes something like that very feasible. I mean, the Sahara is the world's largest desert. And it's an example of a place that gets you know, way too much sun. I mean, more sun than we, people know what to do with. Yeah. And that sunlight can not just be used to create things you know, like power that's shipped across the ocean, but it can actually be used to make things locally uh, at lower costs than then you know, get transported to other regions where the cost of renewable energy is higher. Mm. Uh, I found that interesting in your piece. Uh, you, you brought up this problem of being too uh, country-specific when it comes to creating incentives uh, to spur private investment. W what do you mean by uh, country-specific? No, thank you again for asking this. So uh, maybe I, sh I should try for two examples, and they're kind of contrasting examples. Mm -hmm. So if you were drilling for oil in the U.S. and you, you, you got depletion, allowances, this is quite literally the government paying you to produce you know, fossil fuels in the U.S., which is not necessarily a terrible thing, but you know, we know that in the long run, the world needs to transition away from, from fossil fuels. Um, and you don't get the same allowance for, for doing the exact same thing elsewhere because the money is American money going to an American company operating on American soil, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so it stays local. Uh, to use a more relevant example, I live in Michigan. Uh, if I chose to put a solar panel on my roof right now, uh, the federal government, maybe even the state government, uh, my local you know, utility uh, will pay me some of that money back, as much as 30 to 32% of that money. So again, this is American tax money going to the American household, you know, doing something for the environment in their house in, in Michigan. Mm -hmm. But the reality of a global challenge is that, you know, that 30% of, you know, the, of the solar panel that I'm planning to put on my house in East Lansing here would yield to 30 to 40% more energy if, if it was put on a field in Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. So the, the novel solutions I'm calling for is uh, policymakers need to start considering an accord, and we have some, some of the frameworks for this, things like the Paris Accord, uh, where we ask ourselves, you know, this year, the world will make you know, another $100 billion or however many billion dollars of renewable energy investments, both public and private sector. Where can we get the most positive climate effect for the dollars that we're putting in? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, th there's something, it may, it may make sense from, from a Michigan perspective to support someone like you know, Michael putting his, uh, his solar panel on his roof. But from the global perspective, it doesn't make as much sense because we are we are shortchanging ourselves to the tune of as much as forty percent of the of the effect that we can get. Mm. So it's it's about looking for those those places where you get the most bang for your buck. 
Um, and, and you just you mentioned Ghana and Burkina Faso and you, know, you all these these places that offer tremendous potential in terms of private investment. But what about the risks of doing business in Africa? Uh, you know, a lot of uh, private sec- people working in the private sector uh, avoid Africa, have avoided Africa, uh, because they're worried about, uh, you know, instability, uh, economic as well as political, um, especially in these countries that we're talking about with the greatest need for climate financing. How do you convince investors that the benefits outweigh the risks? There's two answers to that question. The, the, the more obvious one is that they don't need any convincing. The, the, the proof is there. We have you know, windmills that are operating in Kenya right now that, despite the high cost of capital, are still profitable. You have several you know, smaller level you know, solar installations that have been working just fine in spite of the challenges. And from that perspective, you could just argue and say, everywhere you go, there will be some kind of risk. It's the job of businesses to manage risk, and, and that's what you know, businesses do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a more honest response is is actually that people like me, and I should make it clear, I, I grew up you know, as an African before I came to the USA a very, very, very long time ago and became an American. Mm-hmm. Um, m- my experience as, as you know, growing up uh, made it clear to me that there is no such thing as a risky African space. Uh, just as there is no bad city. Every city has one bad neighborhood or two bad neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't avoid the entire city for that reason. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you don't avoid Africa or price you know, and, and everything that's African high because you don't know that you know within the same Africa, there's a Tanzania that has been basically politically stable since you know, forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, Senegal that's never had a coup, you know, like that's in West Africa other than its peers. Um, in Nigeria, that's had you no know, more than twenty years of democracy. Uh, again, with still with its challenges and not without risk. To be clear, um, I guess the the honest answer I'm trying to give you is that for anyone that looks carefully, there is opportunity that comes with limited risk, and then it's up to the private sector to choose the level of risk that you're comfortable with. If if Ghana is the place that you're more comfortable with, then that's the level of risk you're willing to take. You know fine, enjoy. If you have advantages that lets you, you know, manage the risks that are maybe relatively high in, say, Mali or Burkina Faso, you know, go for it. And, and it, it, my conviction is that even if you price the risks in, they're still on top the value that's left untouched or left on the table as things are in Africa right now. Well, let's hope that the private sector does wake up to the fact that there are plenty of opportunities, uh, climate-related opportunities in Africa that would uh, move the agenda forward in terms of dealing with the climate crisis. Michael Olabisi is uh, an assistant professor at Michigan State University. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you, Bruce. I enjoyed talking with you. Look for Michael Olabisi's article, Paying Africa's Climate Bill, in the March issue of Finance and Development magazine. Go to imf.org slash fnd. And look for more IMF podcasts wherever you listen. You can also follow us on X, which used to be Twitter, at imf underscore podcast. I'm Bruce Edwards. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.